Hello, everyone. Um, today, we'll be talking about our work with Adrian Reber on introducing a container checkpoint in Kubernetes and how we can use this for forensic analysis. Um, um, there was a talk uh, a few years back at, at KubeCon uh, introducing forensic uh, container checkpointing and how, um, what are the, the tools that can be used in production to um, perform security, um, to respond to security incidents and how these tools can be used with containers. And one thing during this talk that was mentioned was that containers don't support snapshotting and this time was still in development. And we recently introduced um, a new feature in Kubernetes that allows you to, to take a checkpoint of a container. Um, so in this talk, I will uh, first briefly cover what are the security boundaries in Kubernetes. Um, what are the different threat models that we're going to look into? And then I will cover what is container checkpointing and how does it work? And how we can use this to perform forensic analysis? And what are the limitations and some of the future work? Um, so there are two main areas of concern uh, in in terms of security for Kubernetes. The first one are the configurable components in, in Kubernetes, and the second is um, are essentially the applications that are running in the cluster. Um, in Kubernetes, um, there are many components running on the con control plane node that can be configured. And um, the, um, every node is also running a Kubernetes component called Kubelet that is important to be secure. Uh, namespaces are used for isolation between different tenants. and. Um, the pods are introduced in security context uh, between different containers running on, on the cluster. And containers isolate applications from the host environment itself. And in addition to that, um, every application has different network namespace that isolates the communication, uh, different DNS, for example, and uh, Kubernetes also makes available secrets and tokens uh, to the application. And of course, the application is processing um, sensitive data from users. So um, the three main uh, threat models that we are going to look into is when an external attacker um, um, has access to an application running ov over the network. Uh, in this case, the security controls that are commonly used is to encrypt all network traffic and to use authentication and authorization for all APIs. Um, Another aspect is when an attacker has compromised the container in the cluster or has been able to use a malicious container image to run uh, essentially malicious container on, on the cluster. So in this case, the attacker can try to escape the container or perform privilege escalation to take over the whole cluster. And the common uh, security controls in this case are um, essentially limiting the privileges available to containers um, and limiting the access to the kubelet running on the, on the node and preventing um, the applications running in the container from loading kernel modules and restricting what network access the applications would have. Um, another um, threat model is when an attacker has been able to, for example, uh, steal the uh, keys for accessing the um, Kubernetes API server, so they would be able to create um, pods and create containers in, in, the, in the cluster itself. And in this case, um, different security controls that can be used are role-based access control and limiting what um, a user in Kubernetes can do, and limiting the quotas uh, of resources that can be allocated to a single user. Um, so the problem here is that um, real-time monitoring systems for Kubernetes don't currently support the ability to um, take a snapshot of the of, um, of the applications that are running in a container and use this to um, analyze what has happened during a security incident. And container checkpointing can capture and preserve this state and can be used to analyze um, what has happened at a specific point in time, 
but also we need uh, advanced tools to be able to analyze this state. So how do we enable container checkpointing and how to use it? Um, in, in Kubernetes, uh, there are different pods. Um, there could be multiple pods running on, um, on a cluster node, and every pod can have multiple containers inside it, and every container has a process tree, essentially a set of processes running. Um, when um, the container engine, in this case Cryo, um, is involved to perform a checkpoint, then it would um, essentially call the container runtime, in this case run C, and run C will call Cryo, and Cryo um, is going to create a snapshot of essentially serialize the runtime state of all processes running within the container. And this state can be used then to restore the container from the point in time when a checkpoint was created. But it could be also um, used to analyze what were the processes and what files or a network sockets have been opened at this particular time. Um, so to enable a checkpoint in Kubernetes, Cryo has to be installed on every uh, a Kubernetes node. Um, um, in Cryo version 1.25 was introduced the checkpointing feature and we currently have a pull request for container D. Um, Cryo has to be started with the option enable Cryo support and the container checkpoint um, feature gate has to be enabled for the kubelet in Kubernetes. Um, and then once this is enabled, you, um, you can perform, you can send a post HTTP request to the Kubelet API and uh, specify the namespace, the pod, and the container that needs to be checkpointed. Um, and then um, this, will, um, this will create a checkpoint, essentially a tar archive that contains all the state of the container in, in the default location, uh, in this case, var lib Kubelet checkpoints where um, you can inspect the state further. Um, there is also some discussion about how to optimize um, essentially the way we store checkpoints because um, currently everything is stored in a single directory and we want to limit the amount of checkpoints that are going to be created for a specific container just to, um, if you have periodic checkpointing, to not take the whole disk space available. And for this, we want we we're probably going to create sub uh, subdirectory or directory for every pod that is probably going to come in in a future version of, of uh, Cryo or Kubelet. Um, so I have a, um, a short demo of how this works. So this is a Kubernetes cluster with, um, in this case, just two nodes. And we have um, a pod running a PHP application, in this case, Varavel. And um, I, I, I have a shell script which implements the checkpoint command for kubectl. And this allows me to list what are the different containers and the different pods running on this on this node. Um, so in this case, we have this Warvel pod and with a single container called demo running inside it. So um, this script will send the post request that was shown on the slide, and this will create a checkpoint in the default directory. And in this case, we have um, we have two checkpoints because um, I tested this before the talk to see if it works. Um, 
and we can we can use um, a tool we developed called checkpoint control to inspect the state of essentially to see what is inside of the checkpoint itself and So this is a high-level overview showing um, the IP address of the container that was captured, what is the root diff size. And so these are files that have been modified by the application running inside of the container. We can see all these files included deleted ones. Um, essentially this is capturing the read-write layer on top of the uh, container that is used by the application. Uh, we can see the checkpoint size and the timestamp, essentially when the checkpoint was created. Um, so we recently introduced an, um, this feature that allows us to, to see what are the mount points. So essentially what has been mounted inside of the container. Um, what are the different processes? So we can see the process ID and um, essentially the process name and just a high level overview of what is captured in the checkpoint. Uh, in addition, So if we untar the, uh, the content of the checkpoint, we can see all the files um, inside it. And the, the files or the crew images that the checkpoint into creates are in the subdirectory called checkpoint. Um, before this, I'll just show you the content of um, so. Um, so the uh, root uh, root of start uh, diff is essentially are the files that have been uh, modified in the container. Um, we can use a tool called crit or checkpoint restore image tool um, to essentially decode all the image files. And this allows us to see the details, essentially what's, um, uh, what is the content of all our checkpoint images. In this case, what we are seeing here is the process tree image, which contains essentially a list of all the of all threads and processes and information about the process identifier, the thread identifier, and other additional information um, about what is actually running in, in the uh, um, what is included in the checkpoint. Um, here we also have something called ghost files. So these are also, also known as invisible files. This is essentially when a file has been deleted, uh, but there is an open uh, file descriptor, essentially a file descriptor open for this file then this file is also uh, included in the checkpoint. So we can inspect the content of such files. Um, this is also important if we decide to restore the application and see what, um, how it will perform, um, what actions it's going to perform. Um, and there are many different images and we are currently um, developing the tools to analyze the state of the checkpoint further. So to go back in my presentation, uh, some of the limitations. Um, these are some of the uh, three main limitations that I'm going to focus on today. So um, the Kubernetes secrets are essentially uh, keys or tokens that are um, 
made available to applications running in the container to be able to access resources, for example, database or um, other services running in the cluster. And when we create the checkpoints, since these are this could be stored um, um, either as environment variables or in memory of the application, these are also captured with the checkpoint, which means um, it is important to keep uh, the checkpoints uh, secure so that they uh, we can prevent leaking information about um, sensitive data such as keys. Um, in the case of life migration and fault tolerance, we would want to keep uh, this information in the checkpoint because we can use the checkpoints to recover the application from failure or to move it to a different physical machine. In the case of fast startup, this is when we want to optimize to improve the startup time of applications by taking a checkpoint immediately after um, some index or data has been loaded in memory and uh, starting the application from checkpoint uh, will es essentially improve the start time. In this case, we don't want to keep the, um, the secrets or passwords stored in memory because we want to essentially initialize every application with different key. So in this case, um, we need some techniques or methods to be able to remove uh, this secret information from the checkpoint. Um, on another limitation is when an attacker can essentially perform um, um, different actions that would um, make it more difficult to understand what was actually happening in the container or um, mimicking the, the behavior of trusted processes essentially um, using um, existing processes within the container that would make it more difficult to understand, for example, what is, um, what was actually happening uh, during the attack. And um, an attacker can also um, um, perform a set of actions that are not related to the attack itself, and this would also make it more difficult for, for example, intrusion detection systems to detect uh, this attack. Um, and there are uh, certain cases that CRIU doesn't support. So, um, for example, certain system calls are not supported or certain um, um, network sockets or nested namespaces are essentially features that CRIU doesn't support. So if an attacker wants to prevent the checkpoint from being created, then they could use this type of techniques to um, prevent the checkpoint. and some future work. Um, so how can we use uh, container checkpoints with um, intrusion detection systems and how this can be used for preventing attacks? Um, there are different aspects that can be used uh, from checkpoints. One is to un to um, improve the visibility of tools such as Falco to be able to see what is actually running in a container, but also to use this for uh, further forensic analysis after um, a security incident has occurred. Um, container checkpoints can also be used to detect certain actions and trigger an alarm. And um, a new um, uh, restart policy can be introduced for containers to allow to restart from a checkpoint. And potential attacks that can be used to um, inspect with checkpoints are, for example, SQL injection. We can detect when um, um, certain behavior is happening in the container, and it's the same with command line execution or when um, an attacker is um, using a file inclusion attack. And uh, when a malicious container has been, uh, is currently running on, on the cluster, we can use uh, container checkpoints to detect and improve the monitoring of, uh, of the system and introduce security policies that would allow us to detect uh, different incidents. And finally, I just want to uh, mention about uh, two Google Summer Cloud participants who are currently working on this project and um, have been contributing to, um, to this work. Um, 
and thank you very much and I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, so this is something we have been discussing in the community, how, what would be the best approach of doing this. So it's, it's not implemented yet? Yes. Um, the, the way we discuss about implementing it is to introduce a signal handling. So we can send a signal to the application running in the container, and then the application has to essentially drop the secrets. Uh, mm -hmm. There is another project implementing checkpoint restore for Java applications. They uh, essentially um, perform certain actions before the checkpoint and then uh, uh, c certain actions after the checkpoints which, which can help with this as well. So some listeners and it can be triggered by yeah, triggering the Kubernetes checkpoint, it will trigger inside the Java application this yeah, Some but it, it, it's still in development. It's, uh -huh. it's still something that uh, we are working on. Yes, um, you, um, so after, um, just to repeat the question, um, can we have a log that would list all the checkpoints and then use the checkpoints after an incident has occurred? And yes, uh, this, um, a checkpoint would allow you to not only see what was actually happening in the container, but uh, for example, if an attacker uh, runs something entirely in memory without touching the disk, which is uh, something that is commonly used today, uh, would would, you can use uh, memory forensics or essentially see what was the memory content inside of the checkpoint and uh, understand what was the attack. Yes? Uh, Crew is very optimized, so the way it works is using the P-Tray system code to enter the address space of the process and uh, then use, um, essentially create a Unix socket with the uh, Crew running outside and using splice, which is essentially avoiding copying the memory from the process into a set of files. So it's very efficient, uh, but of course it depends on the size of the, uh, for example, how much memory does the container use, then we have to save all this state. Yes? Um, yeah, so essentially it's, um, I think you need admin permissions at the moment, uh, and essentially you're sending a HTTP request to the kubelet running on the node. Um, so essentially you just need to out be authorized to perform the checkpoint. Uh, but if you can create a checkpoint of a container, then you have access to all the memory of that container. So it's, you know, it has to require admin privileges. Yes? Yes, it, uh, can we um, can we checkpoint the containers one after the other? Was was that your question? Uh, yes. Outside of a container. Yes. Um, so this is actually something that we're working on. Uh, it's essentially. Um, how we can synchronize the checkpoints between different containers. 
Um, so we were introducing essentially a synchronization mechanism that allows to um, create the checkpoints of two containers at the same time, or um, if these containers are running on uh, different nodes to synchronize the checkpointing between different containers. Uh, this, this essentially if you have a, a distributed application running on multiple nodes in the cluster. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone, and um, is that?